In today's episode of the Motorhome Map Podcast, we're diving into the world of upplating and downplating with SVTEC. In the news, a coroner is asking the government to re examine seatbelt laws after the death of a mum and her children. Plus, we have a new Campsite of the Month feature with Alan Rogers. And we answer your questions on reverse polarity and portable sat navs. Keith will be here in just a minute, so I'm taking the time to quickly welcome Ripe to the Motorhome Map podcast. Ripe, an insurance specialist with a new motorhome insurance offering, got in touch with me a few months ago. Now, as you know, I love seeing brands investing in our industry, so I decided to investigate further, and I have to say, I was immediately impressed. I contacted them online as a mystery shopper to build my own motorhome insurance quote, and the service was fantastic. I got my quote in minutes and it was a very competitive premium. Their insurance has been designed to give you protection quickly, easily and at a very reasonable rate. You can build your policy and only pay for what you need, including things like comprehensive European cover that includes theft and damage. I know because I checked. Plus, campervan conversions are also covered. Their motorhome insurance is rated excellent on Trustpilot and they won a Treating Customers Fairly Champion Award voted for by their customers, an accolade I can vouch for. What I really appreciate is that they're only a call away and you'll get through to their UK-based call centre easily if you need help with your cover. If you want to find out more about Ripe, then hit the link in the description below or go to mhmp.info forward slash rpyt. Ripe has even given you, our listener, a discount to save 10% off your premium. Quote Motorhome Matt when you call, or even easier, the discount is automatically applied online at mhmp.info forward slash RPYT. Welcome to the Motorhome Matt podcast. I'm Keith Gooden. And I'm Motorhome Matt. Industry insights and expert advice for the world of motorhomes, caravans and camper vans. And it's brought to you by thatleisureshop.com. Now, we always say it every week, but please do remember to follow on your favourite podcast app. And will you help us by subscribing on YouTube, which is brought to you by arabasecreative.co.uk. We start off the news this week with uh, some very tragic news, uh, but a coroner is asking the government to re-examine seatbelt laws mm. after a mother and two children died when the motorhome they were travelling in hit an HGV on the A64. So what's the detail on this then, Matt? Well, unfortunately, a tyre blew out on the vehicle and it was a defect that would never have been detected by anybody, uh, and apart from a tyre expert, and it just randomly blew out uh, due to a hole in its sidewall, I think it was, and caused the vehicle to, to career. And the steering locked and it skidded into an HGV, uh, killing the occupants. Uh, a terrible, terrible story. It is, and the coroner has asked the government to re-examine those seatbelt laws. So what are they then, Matt? What, what have they got to re-examine? Well, I think the issue here is that the mum and the children were in the back of the motorhome. Uh, they've been self converted so originally it was registered as a commercial van it had been converted to a camper van and it had traveling seats in the back that weren't actually dedicated as traveling seats with seat belts in them uh, and so uh, they weren't you know they weren't safe to be traveling in so when it was converted the the seats in the back of the van were installed and the seat belts were installed uh, but the uh, seats and the seat belts in the front cab mm-hmm. uh, of the van had been installed by the manufacturer and we yeah. must say that not everybody in this terrible accident died the people who were traveling in the front cab survived the seat belts stayed secure correct so yeah our understanding though is that there were no seat belts in the back of this vehicle for the seats that were dedicated to be traveled in uh, and this is the point is which seat can you sit in in the back of a motorhome it's a conversation i've had goodness me i've lost count so many times uh, particularly a motor an older motor with a big rear lounge is can i travel in the back of it no you can't it's really important that you acknowledge and understand which seats in the back of your motorhome are dedicated traveling seats and in the derogation of the vehicle or the certificate of conformity those seats are dedicated to be a traveling seat and if there's a picture of a person 
tra- sat in a seat with a red line through it, it means it is not to be travelled in. It's not safe to be travelled in. One of the things I've seen as well is people fitting their own seat belts, which you can do, uh, but the rules are really clear and they're made grey, sadly, by our own industry. Uh, salespeople will say, I've heard it said, yeah, yeah, you can finally travel in that sideways seat, it's fine. That's really, really unsafe to do that. Our spines don't bend sideways. A, a travelling seat must be forward or rearward facing and should be dedicated as a travelling seat. So ideally crash tested and on the V5 that the vehicle is able to carry the number of people that you're saying can travel in the vehicle. Rear facing seats must have a lap belt. Forward facing seats now on new vehicles must have a three point belt. So the seat belt like you have in the front for the driver and the passenger. Really quickly, you can Google this and you can get the facts for yourself. But from the before the 1st of October 1988, so going back in time, uh, only the driver and passenger in the front of a vehicle had to have a seat belt, a three point belt. And then after the 1st of October 1988, the law was changed that the driver and front passenger must have a three point belt and forward facing passengers must have a two or three point belt. Now, a two point belt is a lap belt. Now, that would mean if you were restrained by a two-point belt facing forward, you could, in a a head-on collision, double over and snap your neck or your spine. So they really weren't safe. A three-point belt holds your torso back against the seat. So it goes across your chest. It goes across your chest, chest And clicks in, like in a car, and then you've got the the, the waist belt going across. So one, two, three points. And then September 2006, this was the big change that really started to affect motorhomes because they came much more prolific that all dedicated travel seats so seats that are fixed to the chassis and dedicated to be a traveling seat must have a two or three point belt which is also fixed to the chassis of the vehicle Um, and that's the important bit that the seat belt frame has to be welded to the chassis of the vehicle i remember having a a six berth motorhome six traveling potential seats in it it came to us from the factory with a mistake it didn't have the rear facing seat belts fitted so we had them added and they could be lap belts because they were rear facing seats they had to have headrests as well and the framework had to go through the floor through the sidewall into the gas cupboard in order to be welded to the chassis of the motorhome it was all sealed up and done professionally and lap belts added to those rear facing seats we had enough payload to do this in the vehicle and then we had to tell the dvla that we'd added two more seats to the vehicle so that became a six passenger motorhome on the v5 and all this stuff is really important so there are lots of people out there that will help you with this um professionals that would 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 do this but also in that 2006 law it was acknowledged that side facing seats are not recommended and actually can be dangerous um and the other rule that was introduced is that children must be in a child seat if they're under 135 centimeters or 12 years old now as always there are some exceptions to this on the grounds of health a child for example can travel in the back of a taxi without a seat belt if there's no child restraint available but the rules for a motorhome are really really simple they are black and white they're not gray it's not okay to travel in the back of a motorhome sideways if there's no seat belt it is the law Um, most police officers will probably turn a blind eye to it but actually this is about your safety and if you get it wrong it can result in death yes Uh, am i right in thinking that this was a conversion this it was it was a van converted to a camper van and whoever converted it added these rear seats which is where the i think the mum and the children were sat without seatbelts. But of course the regulations say that, that they actually weren't an, an, under a, any obligation to add the seatbelts because it was a commercial vehicle. But if you're surely if you're converting it, you're going to want to put professionally fitted seat belts in a standard aren't you yeah of course yeah so this is about taking responsibility as a converter whether it's you and your own van or you're paying a converter to do it to consider the safety of everyone traveling in it Uh, so the guidelines are that from september 2006 every dedicated traveling seat must have a seat belt if it's rear facing a lap belt is fine if it's forward facing a three-point belt is required but you're under no obligation to do it this is the irony here so you can convert a van and add seats to the back 
and you can travel in it without any seatbelts, but it's not safe to do so, as this terrible story confirms. And the coroner is asking the government to re-examine uh, those regulations and laws. And we have to remember when we're driving, it's all about momentum, isn't it? Uh, when, you, when you're accelerating to speed, even fairly low speeds, like 30, 40 miles an hour, the, 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 you're building energy into everything in the vehicle, aren't you? And yeah. if you stop suddenly, the energy doesn't disappear. It goes somewhere. So either you keep travelling forward forward or sideways or yeah. things within the vehicle keep traveling yeah. or as, what happens in a lot of uh, fatalities is that your internal organs keep traveling in the direction it's called and, inertia and, and, and yeah and you t tear your blood vessels don't yeah you? you do internal damage which is where the argument came that a three-point belt was actually dangerous because it holds you in the seat but uh, there's a case for and against but i guess the logic is seat belts are safe the only exceptions are on buses uh, and in taxis when there's not a seat belt available those are the exceptions or you don't have to wear one for medical reasons and you can get a certificate of exemption the, the understanding is seat belts are safe and they increase our safety and there's a much higher chance of surviving a crash if you're wearing a seat belt if you're facing forwards or backwards and they've yeah. been professionally installed and I presume as well, is the certification or not? Uh, that's a very good question, actually. The type approval for the seatbelt and for the seatbelt frame. We uh, didn't get any certification from the company that installed those rear belts I talked about. So um, no certification for the installation? The components are, are the certified. The components were certified, yeah. but I think for me it was about trusting the installer to who mm. you know, did advertise they knew what they were doing. And I guess you could be called for an inspection by VOSA if they wanted to, um, and they could weigh the vehicle to check you've got the payload to carry that number of passengers. Because remember, if you fit rear-facing seat belts as lap belts, they could be for 120 kilo adults. You know, so that's 240 tons, uh, 240 tons, 240 kilos of extra weight. So you've got to have the payload in order to do that. And VOSA could call it in for inspection, I suppose. So it's making sure you're not overweight as well by adding those belts. It's time this month for our Alan Rogers campsite of the month. Matt, over to you. Welcome to our now regular monthly feature, Alan Rogers campsite of the month. Alan, welcome back to the studio. Hi, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alan, this month we've got the most accessible award winner at the Alan Rogers Caravan and Motorhome Club European Campsite of the Year Awards 2024. Punchy. Absolutely. <laughs> so tell us, what's it called? This campsite is called Le Grangeois and it's in the Vendée region. Do you know where that is? That is inland from where we were last month. This is from memory. I think I've been there. Not to this campsite, though. It's inland from La Rochelle, is that right? Yeah, sort of between Nantes and La Rochelle. 10, 15 miles inland? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a lovely part of the world, I have to say. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us, gorgeous. why did it win? So this campsite really focuses on, on accessibility. So they have several f accessibility features. They've got a hearing loop um, in reception for hearing impaired um, visitors. They also have a chairlift system in the pool, so the pool's fully accessible to Brilliant. everybody. Brilliant, yeah. Fantastic. and But this is a everyone's welcome at this campsite, isn't it? This is Absolutely. not just for those of limited mobility, despite winning the most accessible award. What else is at the campsite? Why would we go there? The grounds are absolutely stunning. It's on a 200-acre park. Um, there's an old ma French manor house, real traditional building. Um, there's actually a Gallo-Roman temple. So the campsite wow. dates back, you know, well, the campsite doesn't date back thousands of years, but that, there's a lot of history in that region. Um, the campsite's been owned by the same family for three generations, and Anne and Eric, um, the owners, uh, make sure you get a really good warm welcome. There you are, Anne and Eric. Go and say hi if you go there. Lovely couple. <laughs> Third generation, aren't they? Yeah, they absolutely are, yeah. yeah. Amazing. And what else is available at the campsite then? You say it's got a pool with a chairlift, which is a great idea, but what other features does it have? So they've got, uh, it's perfect if you like horse riding. So obviously, you know, as with all French campsites, there's an amazing pool and there's all, all the sort of usual attractions, mini golf, etc. But the thing, you know, other than the accessibility, the thing that stands out is their riding centre. So you can either take your own horse and they've got stables or you can, you can rent one on site. Take my own horse. How am I yeah. going to get that in the motorhome? Oh, yeah, I'm sure you'll squeeze it in. <laughs> really? So you Sit can up front with you, can't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you said that. So uh, you can hire a horse while you're there, presumably. Can you, you can, yeah, indeed. Okay, well, well, I won't be doing that. But, you know, for some people, they would love to do that. And why not? Absolutely. And if, you, if you've had enough time on the campsite and you're looking for something else to do in the region, have you heard of Puy de Fou? Where? The Puy de Fou. 
It sounds it's, lovely. It's a no, I haven't. What is it? It's a sort of medieval theme park. So they've got rides, attractions, and then live action shows with horses, oh, wow. knights, all that sort of stuff going on. Perfect oh, wow. for family. Oh, it sounds cool. Where's it? Where's it again? That's about an hour away from the campsite, which is in the Vendée region of France. Brilliant. And when is this site open? They're open from early May to the middle of September. Brilliant. And the big question, cost, where are we, cost per night? Oh, towards the lower end, really, of our scale. Uh, if you're going in the low season, you can get it from sort of £25 per night. And then obviously that goes up as you get into the higher season. Sounds brilliant. And just tell us the name of the campsite again. It's Le Grand Joie. Brilliant. Thanks, Alan. That's good. So there we are, the Alan Rogers Campsite of the Month. Brilliant to have Alan with us, as always. And if you want to find out more about all of Alan Rogers' campsites across Europe, you can do so at mhmp.info forward slash Alan Rogers. Cheers. That's our Alan Rogers campsite of the month with somebody who isn't Alan Rogers. No, he's Rob. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've always called him Alan. I think everybody calls him Alan. It's now a standing joke, which I find funny. Probably nobody else does. It's the Motorhome Matt podcast with me, Keith Gooding. And with me, Motorhome Matt. And it's brought to you with thatleisureshop.com. Now, we cover this topic a lot. There's a lot of confusion around it as well. How to upplate your motorhome. So yeah. what do people need to know? Upplating and downplating, payload, what you can and can't do. As I've already alluded to, just even adding two seatbelts to a motorhome can impact your payload. So it's understanding what your payload is. So I thought I would invite invite SV Tech onto the podcast to discuss this. So SV Tech have been around since 1933. They are experts in upplating and downplating and changing payloads of vehicles uh, and, and going through the whole legal process of doing this. And I got Richard to join me at the NEC show. It's been a long time coming, this interview, because trying to tie us together has been difficult. He joined us at the NEC Motorhome Show. Uh, and I started by asking Richard, what is upplating? Upplating essentially means taking your payload, uh, your, your gross vehicle weight rather, from one level to another. So for example, from 3,500 kilos to either 3.7 or 3.850 or 4 tonne. It all depends upon your chassis cap. Right, thank you. Now just explain why you, there are three numbers above 3,500 that are important here. Uh, in terms of regarding to well why why can't i take one vehicle to four ton but i can take another one all oh, right well a lot of that depends upon the original chassis cab so a lot of the three and a half tonners uh, for example on fear are, are built on the 35 light chassis um, more recently we've seen a number coming in on the 35 heavy chassis they can go to a greater level much much higher than the 35 light the 35 light is limited to about four ton the 35 heavy can go up to four seven so dependent upon what you what alterations you make to the vehicle to take it up to that level got it okay so i'm thinking about plating my vehicle because yeah. we want to increase our payload we understand what payload is how much we can carry what things do i need to tell you so you can establish what weight my vehicle can go to well in the first instance um i would like you to get it weighed uh, as with all of these vehicles, we ask everybody to weigh their vehicles so we know where our starting point is because very often somebody might be within the gross vehicle weight but they've overloaded the back axle and without putting it on a weigh bridge you don't know that. Um, but in the first instance, other than the weigh ticket, we would need somebody to fill in one of our inquiry forms, I'd need to see photos of the VIN plates, I'd need to know what the tyre sizes are um, and I would need to know um, what the, sort of the braking setup is. I can do all of that work once I've got the VIN plate details and then I can search that vehicle and then uprate it accordingly. But it's true though, isn't it? Fiat aren't very helpful with their VIN number, it doesn't tell you exactly what you need to know about that chassis. Renault, on the other hand, is far more helpful. There's clues in the VIN, yeah, yeah. but there's stuff like you need to know, like wheel size, tyre size, yeah. um, brake disc size, is no, that right? No, not necessarily. Um, a lot, every vehicle that we uprate has to be covered by a brake report. You can't uprate a vehicle without having a brake report behind it. We've spent the last 33 year, 30 years brake testing vehicles. Uh, we take the base chassis unit, we run them around, we put a lot of weight on the, on the chassis and we run it around a test track and we stomp on the brakes and we see what happens. We can uprate beyond manufacturer's brake reports because we've done brake testing to a higher level than, than anything that we, if, if I approve a vehicle at 4.5, I probably brake tested it to 4.7 to be on the safe side, but I will only approve it to 4.5 because I don't want that tolerance being lost. And a lot of times people are uprating vehicles 
to write 3850 without an air kit on the back and that is literally beyond the tolerance of that rear axle but people are doing it because they think they can um, I see. So when you say air kit, you mean airbags yeah, on the rear? Yeah, airbags axle. on the back. Um, obviously, airbags on a, on a steel chassis are a, a, a lot less expensive than on an Alco system because the torsion bar air system is a lot more expensive. So we do find people who are coming to us on Alco who have got vehicles that, let's say, are at 3,650 um, and they want to go up as high as they can, but we can only get them to 3,850 because of their rear, because of their torsion bar on the back axle we can take that back axle up to 2240 if there's an air kit on it but if it doesn't have an air kit on it it's got to stay at the original 2000 which makes it quite complicated so so anybody who's looking at their vin plate will not know this until they actually look under the bonnet see the fiat vin plate the alco vin plate and the motor manufacturer's vin plate yep. there has to be three vehicles on the three pl plates on the vehicle and you've got to follow that legal process so right this is complicated and that's why you exist yeah. uh, and you should make sure that if you're listening to this you go to a recognized company that will do this work for you that's really important mm -hmm. isn't it uh, a paper exercise that's a phrase that gets banded around yeah. oh yeah i can uplate my vehicle it's a paper exercise that suggests that i could do it myself it's not always the case not all, not the case at all uh, an uprate can only be carried out by an approved converter with a dvsa or with, with VOSA. So you have to be on the list at Swansea as an approved converter. We're one of four, I think, uh, converters on the list that uh, that can do up rates. I believe there's only one other person that actually does them um, other than ourselves. Um, but I would reiterate that you have to make sure that whoever's converting it carries out brake checks and brake tests rather. Um, if they don't do a brake test for an up rate, it's not legal. And uh, you could find yourself in a lot of uh, deep doo-doo if you are running around running around the road with a vehicle that is has been uprated illegally mm -hmm. and beyond the capacity of those axles and there's no brake report to cover it so yeah. that, that that's really dangerous and how do people find out which company has been doing a brake report uh, we've well, got to ask them. You've got to get copies of, you know, you need to go to them to say, right, have you done your brake testing? Yes, we've done our brake testing. Can I see a copy of the report as needs be? We don't often give out copies of reports because we ask them to go to Swansea to obviously uh, ratify what we do. We can only, you know, we... All of, our, all of our brake reports are held at Swansea. We send them off there where they're all held there. Any vehicle that comes along of that type that matches that report, we can uprate against that report. It's like a model report. And then everybody's vehicle who comes along will be dot one, dot two, dot three against that report. Um, if you don't have those brake reports, you shouldn't be uprating at all. Right, okay, well there you are, you heard it first here. So downplating, my vehicle is 3650. I can't drive it because I've got a C1. Mm -hmm. I want it to be 3500. Is that a paper exercise? Just fill out the V5, change it to 3500 when I put it in my name? Not anymore, unfortunately. You need to be able to prove to the ministry what payload you've got available at three and a half tons and that that's suitable for your needs. You have to sign a declaration form to say to them, having weighed the vehicle, this is how I've weighed it. It weighs 3,200 kilos empty with the driver in and that leaves me at 3,500, that leaves me 300 kilos, and that's suitable for my needs. This is the condition, I weighed it in with a sat satellite TV, air conditioning, bike rack, bump, bump, whatever it might be, 50% water, and I've still got that payload available. The ministry takes a very dim view of people um, downrating vehicles to three and a half ton and then immediately overloading them, because that's like a joyriding offence. Again, you know, because there's no licence. You're overloaded and there's no licence. And uninsured, and, presumably. And uninsured. I mean, any time that you're running overweight, you're running the risk of being uninsured. In, an, in the event of an accident, if you're overweight, you are not covered by insurance. And, uh, you know, we've seen cases over the last 10 or 15 years of people being in accidents and having their vehicle impounded and everything weighed and then having the book chucked at them. And you don't want to go down there. I mean, I right. really don't want to go down that route. I'm sure you've got some horror stories around that, Absolutely. Richard. So we're, we're here at the NEC show, uh, the Caravan Cabinet Motorhome Show. Uh, we're surrounded by, I'm told, 700 new vehicles, many of which are motorhomes. Uh, there's loads of people here for the first time looking at these motorhomes, a bit kind of rabbit in the headlights, you know, because there's so much choice. What should they consider? So I, I always preach to people, if you add in extras like an awning, a solar panel, you mentioned a satellite dish, uh, and, and these other extras, a bike rack, an air conditioning unit, they all carry weight, yeah. and that's going to have an impact on your payload. But what should they consider when they're looking at these vehicles in terms of gross weight, payload, and so on? 
Well, obviously, the more payload you can get, the better. Um, one of the things that we see a lot of people don't do is they don't buy the right motorhome for their needs. So they go to the motorhome show or to a dealer. The dealer convinces them to buy this very nice little three-berth three birth vehicle. Um, and actually, six months down the line, they've got five people that want to be in it, the family dog. You know, they're absolutely loaded up to the hilt. And in reality, they've not bought the right motorhome. So the first thing is you've got to really bottom out what it is you're going to be using it for. And then in the second instance, don't believe the, the curb weight in the brochure because they are based upon a three and a five percent margin of error and that means if you have a motorhome that says it weighs three thousand kilos empty it could possibly weigh at five percent margin of error three thousand one hundred and fifty well that's two people and that makes a massive difference and if you suddenly have bought this vehicle for eighty thousand pounds thinking you've got 500 kilos of payload and you get in it and you're left with you know 350 to birth four people and the family dog and all your stuff and your water and your extras it's going to be a physical impossibility but what about fundamentals like diesel uh, when this curb weight is worked out so the empty weight let's yeah, yeah. call it that uh, so we can calculate our payload is, is that standardized you know I mean I know it's not but you know so I'm answering my own question here what should we need what questions should we ask of manufacturers and of the dealer selling the vehicle in terms of well what's included in the curb weight yeah well exactly I mean you the um, mass in running order figures have changed over the last few years. It used to have to include 90% water and a half a tank of diesel. It doesn't include that anymore. They've got rid of that 90% water. Now, if you've got a, a tank that carries 100 litres of, of water, that's, you know, that's 90 kilos that you're lo losing out of that mass in running order. So it makes it look great for the manufacturers because they've now got a vehicle that used to have a payload of 230 and it's now sitting there with 320 kilos worth of payload. That looks far, far better for selling it. But when you come to then travel and you put your water in and you've got all your people in and you put your extras in, I guarantee you, you'll be overloaded. Yeah. So our advice is, has always been caveat emptor. Whatever, you, whatever you're gonna buy, new or second hand, get a weight ticket for that specific vehicle as it sits there today before you drive it away from the dealer because that's the only way you're going to be covered. And caveat emptor, caveat emptor means yeah, buyer beware. beware. Buyer. Yeah. Yeah. So it's making sure you've got the right vehicle, right weight. Yeah. Uh, but you, I, I'm ordering a vehicle here at the show. I can't drive it out and take it to a Weybridge and check it. What do I do? No, well, ultimately, you've got to make an agreement with them that you're not going to actually part with your deposit or your money until you've weighed it in the situation that you want it. Because if you're going to have five or six extras on there that aren't standard on the vehicle, they're all going to add weight. And you need to have a look then, right, that weighs 36 kilos, that weighs 60 kilos, that weighs 40 kilos. Add those up, take them off your payload, and I guarantee you'll be in for a shock. And, and that's why we come in, because all of a sudden, somebody's spent 80 grand on a machine, and they're illegal as soon as they drive it out of the, out of the showroom. And we've seen that numerous occasions. So it really is about doing your research and make sure you know what all the extras weigh and what payload you're being given by the manufacturer in it. It's worth noting as well that each vehicle, the same model, comes out of the factory at a different weight because it actually depends different. how much sealant and how many screws are in it, doesn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely, hence why there's this margin of error in all the brochures because they can't put an exact figure on it. Yeah. Um, that doesn't leave the consumer in a very good position because all of a sudden it's a guessing game and you don't want to be having a guessing game with £80,000 of hard-earned cash. You know, um, I do think that the, the market needs to change a little bit. I do think there needs to be some change in the licensing laws, as we talked about, uh, you know, off screen in terms of taking the B license up to 4250. I think that might be something like that might happen, but we've been talking about this for three years. So I know it would be a great benefit to the motorhome market and to all those people that are running around in three and a half tonners on a B license, yeah. you know, because yeah. they won't be illegal anymore. Well, that is an ongoing topic of discussion. Uh, with a general election this year in 2024, who knows what will happen after that, yeah. but we'll keep you posted for sure. Richard, just very quickly on costs, what yeah. am I looking at if I want to upplate? What am I going to be spending? Uh, about £280 plus of that. So it's, uh, it's not a huge amount of money. And, it, and literally, if you're going into the private HGV category from light commercial vehicle, your tax goes down from £280 a year down to 165 325 no, 20, now. No, 325 yeah. down to 165 So it pays for the uprating itself in just a little over two years. So that's our fee to you. Yeah. But if I've got to fit airbags, 
reflectors maybe along the sides. Yeah. I might have to change my tyres. Uh, it depends. A lot of cases, if you're going to operate the back axle, um, we might need a tyre change, and that's just going to go. If you're on the 15 inch, you might need to go to the slightly wider 225. Uh, 225s or if you're on 16s you should be fine a lot of the times for up rates on the rear axle we need we need 116 load rating or above okay. um, if you're on a, a bigger motorhome and you're taking the back axle up to 27 for argument's sake then we're going to need a 118 or a 121 load rating and you help with all of this yeah, don't we you can advise all of that I, I can source kits as well we deal with all of the major air suspension manufacturers from the glide rights to the air right to vb um, we obviously realize that we couldn't pin our mask to any single one of those people because it's up to individuals to make their own choice as to what air kit that they want yeah. um, and there are pros and cons to all of them um, and cost is obviously one of those an alco air kit will set you back you know fitted more than two grand whereas uh, an air kit for the rear axle on a steel chassis on the on the normal leaf spring can be fitted for about 700 quid yeah. so there's a really big difference um, if you're going to have a tyre change and you're going to go to the wider uh, the, the wider 225s then we would suggest people keeping those tyres that they're taking off and utilising them on the front when the you know when it comes time to change the tyres ah, on the front crafty tip so yeah I mean just, it does any, every little helps doesn't it Matt yeah. you know? no fantastic so where can people find out more about your company SV Tech um, well in the first instance go to our website uh, svtech.co.uk um, we have every every conceivable form and information that you could need on there um, and you know you can put an inquiry on you get a response from us within 24 hours in terms I'd also add that you can ring you up can't oh, you oh yeah absolutely and Gareth has said to me back in the office that he'll often have five or six conversations yeah. with a consumer before you do anything. Oh, absolutely. And they, look, at the end of the day, people have to feel comfortable doing this and they've got to weigh the, pro, weigh the, you know, the pros and the cons. Um, you know, the pro for me has always been the fact that you're staying legal, you're not uninsured, um, and obviously you've got greater capacity to you know, carry more things in your van, um, especially if you're going through the continent. That, that sort of thing is invaluable. We would advise people if they can't you know take it up to the you know uh, to, to the weight that they want to do to realize and remember that they can put some weight in a bit in a trailer or a car that they're towing behind that vehicle if they've got a tow bar and it's obviously a suitable rated tow bar um, you know and they're pulling let's say a small trailer or something then they can obviously put stuff into the train weight and you can take it out of the of the main motor home and put it in that and obviously then for stay legal and stay safe yeah um, you know we would advise everybody if they're running a trailer it might well weigh them all together so you get a combination weight for the whole lot so you know where your where your opportunities are for loading yeah Richard Drinkwater to there, the business development manager at SV Tech, uh, making a lot of things clear. Then, Matt, not just opinion, uh, but facts. I, I tell mm. you what, are they paying for this? Who SV Tech? Yeah, no, they haven't. No, we do we do self sponsorship on the podcast, but this was unpaid. I promise. They're just a brilliant company. You know, I've actually worked with them for years, uh, getting horse boxes. There, that's another big niche and big topic as well because horses are heavy uh, and it's a constant discussion in that niche about payload what can it carry as it is in the world of motorhomes and camper vans so I've worked with Richard and his team for gosh I don't know how long 20 odd years uh, and they're really clever at understanding a VIN number uh, and from that working out what the vehicle can and can't carry and what can and can't be done to it to improve its payload uh, and they're just experts in their field so they're a great business and one I've always gone to. So what is the process for people looking to do this? Uh, the first thing I would say is there are a number of people out there that will help you do it, but do your due diligence, as Richard suggests. Um, check what uh, kind of registration have they got, what experience have they got, um, what certification have they got, are they happy to share that with you. I can vouch for SV Tech from first-hand experience, and we've successfully up-plated and down-plated vehicles I don't know how many times, lots of times with their help. Uh, and, and I know lots of people who've used them to help them do it. Uh, so I would recommend and commend SV Tech to you as the experts in this field. And there aren't that many, to be honest, uh, but certainly they are the boys that know what they're doing. So uh, I, I would certainly consider getting their help. But we do have something which has been rather secret, which is coming soon, don't we, Matt? We do. So we've been asked a lot, who do I use for insurance, for trackers, for warranty, for cleaning 
products for uplating uh, down up that as yeah. well yeah <laughs> and and so in the background and this has been a big secret we have been building a motorhome mat approved directory Ooh. and these are brands companies products and services that i've used had ha, have had first-hand experience of or i can recommend to you our listener and it's coming very very soon it is called motorhome mat approved uh, we should get sv tech on it you know we should they'd have to pay for that <laughs> <laughs> but we need to we need to make sure we can keep the podcast alive because keith's bill is getting bigger and bigger and needs funding it's ever since i started uh, going out uh, with uh, uh, that T- uh, Taylor Swift. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and Taylor. <laughs> Old Swifty. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh no, that's you. Ta- um, <laughs> ta- Tay, as I know it. Tay. Tay. <laughs> Does she call you Key? Yeah. I just like to say that that was a joke, and Taylor Swift and I have no personal. <laughs> relationship whatsoever uh, nor a business one just in case our lawyers are listening <laughs> just in case yeah i'm sure they are but anyway so the motorhome mat approved directory let's stick there shall we uh is is available to, to, for you to benefit from so it will launch any day soon so keep an eye on that we'll start talking about it on social media and it will feature in the podcast and it's all the brands i love that i have used some for many many years including who i have insured my own vehicle with uh, who i use to help me up plane downplate uh, and a host of other products and services um, so stay tuned for that it's the motorhome map podcast i'm keith gooden and i'm motorhome Matt. and it's brought to you by that leisureshop.com it's time now for our q and a and peter in coventry has been in touch he says in a recent podcast episode you went over reverse polarity that's electrical reverse polarity and i wanted to point something out that i think was either an error or if it is correct could be some cause for concern you mentioned that motorhomes are protected in the consumer unit with a single pole switch slash breaker uh, this should not be the case all caravans and motorhomes should be fitted with dual pole breakers in fact in the uk there is a specific subsection of the electrical installation regulations that's british standard 7671 that provides details for caravans motorhomes and other similar vehicles he it says it's section 721 within bs 7671 section 721 <laughs> It details the requirements uh, is to have dual pole breakers. So, Matt, dual pole breakers. Very exciting, this, isn't it? If you find your motorhome is fitted with a single pole RCD, residual circuit something, MCB, (laughs) miniature circuit breaker, or similar device, you should consider getting it swapped out by a competent electrician, even in countries where this may not be a regulation. But this makes complete sense for the reasons you already explained in your explanation around reverse polarity. Well... Peter, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Peter. But you haven't made it absolutely clear. So, was it an error, Matt? I mean, Peter's obviously right. Yeah, Peter is pole, right. Dual pole, dual Absolutely. Mean, BS 7671 is a real thing. He's quite up. right. The reality is, older motorhomes do have single pole breakers. That's the point. Uh, and the, the thing is to check, have you got a single or a dual pole breaker? And the only way to know is you get an electrician to look at it, unless you know yourself, or get it inspected by your habitation engineer when you're having the hab check done. I actually went to our friends at Bristol Caravans, and my dear friend Oakley, who's a bit of a techie nerd when it comes to this stuff, and I presented Peter's point to him. Uh, and he said, regarding your question about RCDs fitted to caravans, motorhomes, campervans used for leisure, these vehicles, if fitted with a 230 volt, system should be protected by a two-pole rcd during the eicr safety check recommended every three years by the ncc and the aws workshop scheme the rcd is checked and if found to be single pole it is reported to the owner with a strong recommendation to upgrade to two pole if the owner declines the upgrade a warning notification is attached to the vehicle now the point here is that is every three years and that's the recommended time scale to get this eicr check done there aren't that many motorhome service centers who even know what the eicr check is let alone doing it so my advice to you if you're listening to this and you're concerned about this is go and get your circuit breaker checked peter is right it should be two pole my experience is that many are not hence we made the point Um, and it's a mute point that it should be Uh, lots of them aren't so 
Again, it changes. It's actually really simple. And what it does is it trips out the live and the neutral in the event of an equipment failure causing a problem, and it keeps you safe. So just go and if you get an electrician, go and have a look at your circuit breaker, and they'll be able to confirm to you whether it's single or dual pole. Hello, big boy. Come and look at my circuit breaker. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Was that your chat up line to Taylor Swift? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of letters in there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Peter. We Thanks, are Peter. taking the mickey. We, but, we, yeah. we must be said that the electrical standards book is updated every year, and you know, electricians have pointed at things at me. And uh, yeah, I mean, well, one point I want to make here about the EICR check, right? It's a really good safety check. What does for, it stand for? I electrical installation. I uh, can't remember. I can't, can't remember. remember. EICR. EICR. Electrical installation. I can't remember. <laughs> but when you're having your HAB check done, ask them, do you do the EICR check? Do you offer it as a bolt-on service? It is recommended by the National Caravan Council to have it done every three years. So ask them. If they're AWS approved, they should know what it is uh, and they should have someone competent to carry it out. So definitely do your research into that. And if you are advised by an electrician to upgrade it, it's not going to cost a lot of money. Just do it. Uh, it's Harry Gate from Harrogate. It's not really Harrogate. It was anonymous <laughs> from Harrogate, but I think I'm going to call him Harrogate. When travelling in Europe, would you recommend a portable sat-nav or the one built into the dashboard? That's a great question. I was asked this in the presentation I gave on travelling to Europe. We use a portable sat-nav, and do you know the reason why? The great thing is we can move it from vehicle to vehicle. We Ours, we can put our dimensions of the motorhome in, so we do drive different motorhomes. Uh, it's called having access to a higher fleet, and we can take a seven berth or we can take a two berth. And when we're in the seven berth, we don't want to end up down a country lane with grass up the middle. Nightmare. Uh, so we put the size in to try and stop that happening. But the best reason for me having a portable sat-nav is the ability to take it out of the van and sit down in the evening with a paper map and plan your route. Sit there with a bottle of wine, big bar of cabbage, dairy milk, and look at where we are and where we want to end up. And having a paper map of the area you're in and being able to plan the route on paper, you just cannot do that on a sat-nav, and then plot that into the sat-nav for when we head off in the morning. That is the reason we love having a portable sat-nav, so we can do that. You can't easily do that when it's in the dashboard. I'd sit there at night with a glass of whiskey, some chicken legs, and Gloria Estefan. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a perfect night in. <laughs> there you go. Uh, by the way, you're not talking about the sat navs and people's phones here, are you? Oh, you could use sat nav in your phone. They're portable, aren't they? But they tend to absolutely drain the battery really fast. So we use Copilot. That's a great little app. Waze is a brilliant app that you can't put dimensions in that. But I find they make the phone flat, so it's got to be charging whilst you're using it. So there you go. Now, if you want to ask Matt a question, a record a question, uh, or just write one out for us, uh, please say where you're from. What should people do, Matt? Head to mhmp.info forward slash ask Matt. That's Motorhome Matt Podcast. Get it? Dot info forward slash ask Matt. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Yeah, please hit the subscribe and the little bell. Uh, and YouTube is brought to you by arabasecreative.co.uk. And you can also share this episode. What's the detail on that one then, Matt? Dead easy. Just take a link from the YouTube or from an audio podcast and send it to a friend. If you think someone would benefit from the information in this podcast, please share it. It would be lovely to reach more people. Mm.